Good morning, everyone, and praise the Lord. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I trust that there are others who will join us, as is their habit. But thank you for being here, being a part of the core that helps us set the atmosphere of worship as we enter into the presence of the Lord, or rather turn our attention to him because he is with us. Isn't it awesome to be spirit-filled? It means there's not a moment that he's not with us. In fact, he promised that. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always. And that's an awesome thing. But there is something that happens when we gather together corporately. Because Jesus said, in the midst of two or three of you, there in your presence, I will be. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we invoke your name. We ask for you to be sovereign in this place. Let your will be done. Let your word come forth. Let our hearts be open and receptive to your direction. Oh, Jesus, I worship you and I praise you and I glorify you. For you are worthy, oh God. You are worthy, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. It was, if you were here Friday night, I thought it was very funny, Sister Sandy, talking about leading songs and having Dad at that time behind her singing off-key or the wrong words or just getting things wrong and now her doing it. And so uh, Sister Lil's coming to lead you in the right words, and uh, and I'm going to be over here bellering just like Dad. And she... Uh, She's doing a great job of ignoring my vocal accompaniment. Every once in a while, we roll out a new song that she doesn't know, and she's thankful for me. But only every once in a while. Once in a great while. Let's sing unto the Lord. Aren't you glad that he loves the praises of his people? Let's praise him this morning. Praise you, Jesus. Yeah, I was certainly thinking when I heard Sandy say that, wow. Like father, like son. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you recognize that. <laughs> God is good. How many of you glad we serve a risen Savior? Amen. That we serve a, a God that's very much alive and, and not some stone or some mystical figure, but our God is alive and in our midst and working actively in our lives all the time. Worship members be saying, God's not dead. <laughs> I 
Oh, we worship you, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for your life-giving spirit, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Shake all your book for your shame. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You know, one day, if you keep saying yes, yeah, we're going to fly away. Amen. And we're going to go home with this God that's been working on our behalf. And uh, we get to see him face to face. That's going to be an awesome day. Amen. Worship him as we sing, I'll fly away. Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Let's continue to worship him as we sing near the cross. Praise you, Jesus.
Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you today for the cross. Oh, Lord, the glory of this season in your birth, but oh, you came, you were born to die. Oh, the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for loving me enough to die on that cross. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to take the shame of the cross, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for despising it for the joy that I was set before you. I praise you and I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We magnify you this morning. We glorify your name, Lord. We glorify your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. 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 You've heard me say this before, but I remind you again that the cross was that which offended Paul. Then he was known as Saul and he said it cannot be. He believed in the Messiah, the anointed one, the Moshiach that would come. But it cannot be this Jesus. For cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. It cannot be him. But the Apostle Paul, unlike Acts, describes that at the right time, already ordained of God, God revealed His Son in me. You can find it in Galatians, that exact wording. And when that revelation occurred, what Paul saw had felt so firm was the proof that this could not be the Messiah could not be the Christos, the anointed one. Swung to the other side and he says, I purpose to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The gospel is of none effect without the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul clearly said, it would have been in vain. But there is no resurrection without the cross. The instrument that necessitated the almighty display of power, raising himself from the dead, it had to exact the toll of death first. And today the gospel that we believe in, today the message that we have preached, and that we celebrate this lighthouse, this part of the body of Christ that has preached this gospel for 35 years, central to it is the cross. The cross is a place of pain and suffering. It's a place of shame and degradation. It smells... It's abhorrent. It's not aesthetically pleasing. But it's in the cross. It's by the shed blood that ran down that cross that we are healed. 
And that healing is not just, it does include, but it is not just physical healing, but it is all that is wrong with humanity. Every aspect of what sin has done in our lives. The Apostle Peter said, by his stripes, we are healed. As I thought to come and lead you in prayer this morning, there are those that have physical needs. Sister Janice Pinckney's brother is in desperate need of prayer. Haley, Tiffany, and Corey's little girl is at home struggling, having a lot of phlegm, and we need to pray for her. There are physical needs, people that you know of. But I would like to ask you if you would. I love this display to my left and your right on the baptisms. And there are many on that list that have gone on to glory. There are others that have moved around the country. And by faith, I trust that they are continuing to serve Jesus. But there are others on that list that for some reason, they didn't catch sight of the cross. They didn't see what Jesus really did for them. I'm not trying again to be a downer here, but this is all about people, and I can't look at that list without saying, Oh God, is there somebody on that list that if I would pray, somehow maybe you can reach them? I may not even know that he reaches them, I don't even need him to notify me. Maybe it's going to happen in California. Maybe it's happening in Asia. Maybe it's somewhere around the world. But would you collectively join me this morning in addition to all of our other needs? And would you pray for those that are on that list that have received that powerful name of Jesus in baptism, but somehow did not catch the vision of the cross? Because you see the vision of the cross is when the Master laid himself down upon that cross, it then calls me to lay myself down at his feet. When he who ruled became ruled in order that I be set free. That's the vision of the cross. My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I don't get to say what's going to happen. I don't get to tell him what to do. Without that vision, the gospel sometimes falls short of what we expect it to do. And we do our own thing. We go our own direction. But the cross still has power. Can we release it this morning? I don't know how that works, but I do know that prayer bonded together in Jesus' name works. Would you lift it? Maybe you even know somebody's name on that list that needs to come back and get a vision of the cross. But even if you don't, would you lift them up? Take your needs before him. Take your physical needs, but lift them up before him right now. Jesus, God, as we celebrate what you have done, Lord, as we honor what has happened in the past and as we celebrate where we're at today. Oh, God, my heart still beats for the lost. God, reach right now. Hear the cry of this preacher. Hear the cry of this congregation. Hear us as we lift our loved ones, our lost ones, the ones who somehow have missed the message, have missed the message of the cross. Reach for them, O oh God. Once again, send your Spirit forth with the power and the effectiveness of our fervent prayer. Touch them now in Jesus' name. God, we trust you. We are not depressed. We are not burdened down unbearably. But, O oh God, we love with a love that came from you. Reach them now, Lord Jesus. Perform the miracles that it's got to be, Lord, to reach them. God, by your power and your might, somehow overcome the barriers. Overcome that which stands between them and you and the cross. Oh God, overcome it in Jesus' name and reach them, Lord. 
God, we do trust you and we have faith in you, but God, we also, with burden, call out to you. We come before your throne of grace. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Reach them. Reach them. Bring them back to the cross. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. How many of you agree that there's no one like Jesus? Amen. No one like him. Worship members be saying, there's none like you, and I love you, Lord.
would you love him together right now hallelujah jesus i love you lord oh and i lift my voice to you jesus to worship you to worship you to worship you hallelujah 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 i worship you i worship you hallelujah 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 i worship you jesus you are a mighty god you are an awesome god and i love you this morning hallelujah 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 i praise your name jesus i glorify and worship you jesus hallelujah 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 jesus hallelujah jesus praise your name lord praise your name jesus hallelujah hallelujah there's a beautiful sweet spirit of god in this place i come to service anticipating what god will do i don't know if you realize this but while I do have great influence over how a service runs and what happens within it, I, like you, am attempting to come here and let God be sovereign and to do His will. And so it is with anticipation that I step to the podium and I open a service and then I step back and as we begin to sing those songs, I begin to feel after, just as you are, what presence is in this place. It's Him. But what is he trying to do today? And it's, it's never the same. It's, it's unique. It's particular. And I feel the presence of God in this place so beautifully. Hallelujah. And I know that God never comes ineffectively. He comes prepared to do exactly what he knows that we individually and collectively need. And I'm so thankful for that. Praise God. I never want to become so organized and so structured that God is not sovereign in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Would you turn to a few of your neighbors around you and greet them? Hug their neck. It's part of your worship. Love God. Love the people. And then you may be seated. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This weekend has been busy, and obviously we're kind of at the fulcrum, the tipping point of this weekend. Um, but we do have things that are occurring this week, and so if you'll allow me for just a moment to draw your attention to this upcoming week, we do have on Wednesday night our KBN Christmas party, as well as then on Saturday running concurrently. Um, in two different locations, our teen Christmas party at the Cooper residence. Art, are you ready for all the young people to invade your house? No. I, I, did you know that you were marrying such a youth-oriented wife when you married her? All right, then, I, then I'm not going to feel sorry for you. 
I was making, I was hoping I hadn't mistakenly not let you know that. And uh, so that'll be at five o'clock at the Cooper residence, good time there. And then at the same time, uh, in our fellowship hall, the young adults Christmas party will be going on. And yes, some of you are on the cusp and you're going to have to pick this year. Am I a teen or am I a young adult? And uh, either way, you will not lose. And so uh, make yourself available to that. And Wise lady. <laughs> As we grow, you will have to, congregation, get used to some things running concurrently. The schedule won't allow us to split, split things up in that way. Your time is coming, Padre. Just be still and know that I'm pastor. <laughs> Uh, if you were at the banquet yesterday, you heard about Brother Jeremy getting very nervous when Dad and I start up. Don't get nervous. You all know how we are. <laughs> so those things are happening this week. And then, of course, next Sunday morning, I think we're going to be just, by the time we're done with this weekend and next Sunday morning, we're just going to be full up, uh, is our Christmas giving service. And God always shows up so specially in that service. And so come prepared to give Jesus his biggest and best gift. We're going to enjoy a good time celebrating that. And then, of course, uh, if you haven't noticed on the, the December-January special events calendars, we are having, uh, in lieu of our normal Wednesday evening services, uh, we will be having Tuesday evening services in the next two weeks, uh, having Eve services. So December 24th at 7.30, we will have Christmas Eve service. And then on Tuesday, December 31st, we will have New Year's Eve service, followed by Food and Fellowship. So you want to make yourself available to all of that and then, of course, be in preparation for our 30 days of prayer and fasting in January. And uh, we're looking for the Lord to minister to us and lead us and guide us in all that needs to happen there. Amen. And uh, we had such a great time yesterday at the banquet. Thank you all for being faithful to that. And I trust you all made it home safely. Um, without any trouble. Did the Shellicks have to do the Von Trapp thing again? No, it worked this time. All right, that's good. A little difference between a skiff and uh, five inches, huh? And uh, uh, I was drawn, my attention was drawn this morning to something. Uh, at the banquet, I threatened to ban the Williams family from guessing anymore since Sister Thelma won all the pennies last year and Brother Vincent Williams, if you weren't there, won 1,056 Hershey Kisses. If, he, if you're smart, Vincent, you'll give a few to your wife and say, see, I give you kisses all the time. <laughs> anyway, um, Brother Hollis drew my attention that he, the year before, won and the, these two families, between the Williams and the Pens, they live in Scottfield. So maybe I need to ban the development of Scottfield <laughs> from, from guess. Well, he's prophetically, we'll see if his words fall to the ground or not, saying you're going to win it next year or Brother Shane, one or the other of you. So um, anyway, we'll see. If it does happen, I may have to take measures here. We need it to move around a little bit. Such a privilege and an honor to have Brother and Sister Pasley with us, and uh, I thank them both for making time. They pastor an awesome uh, and large, vibrant, and active church in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Brother Pasley is in high demand across our fellowship. This man graces routinely every single year the platform of General Conference, speaks in many, many venues, and I thank him for um, gracing us with his presence and for Sister Pasley to come. Uh, for years and years, I had to trust that Brother Pasley had a wife, otherwise known as the brunette, if you did not know that. Brother Littles calls his the hotness. 
I don't know how I missed that, Jim. I've never heard that before in my life. The only thing, Sherry, I was so sad about is where I was sitting, I couldn't see your face. <laughs> well, Brother Pasley has always called his wife the brunette. And uh, that's what I've heard all the time. And so I wasn't sure if I could land the brunette. And now I found out that I really didn't, but the gray head did. And I thank her for coming taking time and being here and um, we really are so honored to have you come brother Pasley you're not a stranger to us and I thank you for that your friendship to our family and also to this church over the years um, you've been here in multiple iterations and uh, I thank you for that and we're so pleased and privileged to have you here we're looking forward to your ministry oh by the way somebody in the congregation timed you yesterday Ten minutes, five seconds. That's pretty good. I told you he would keep ten minutes. Amen. At this point in the service, we're going to turn to a little bit more of remembrance over the past 35 years. And part of that honoring of that past 35 years is, is also honoring mom and dad. And uh, we gave opportunity to each of the daughter works, people who have gone out from us to across Friday night and Saturday to honor them. And today is our day to add to that. Now here in the local church, obviously we get to honor them in so many different ways on a consistent basis. The biggest honor that mom and dad could ever receive is the fact that we have created a space that they were able to stay here while still retiring. And though a few of you elders are still struggling to let them retire, most of you have made peace with the fact that the young upstart is now the pastor. And you use me most of the time, except when I won't get you coffee. But, so the largest honor that mom and dad have been able to receive, and Regina and I are privileged and honored to be able to do this for them, is that they haven't had to build something and then in order for there to be order, leave it. And so every Sunday that they come and worship here, every service that they're able to sit in these pews, and every time that dad is able to still step back into this pulpit and preach to us as he can, every time that mom's able to hug a neck or pat an arm as we heard yesterday, but still not have the ultimate responsibility and the accountability of pastoring, um, we honor them in that. We give them, and it's very valuable to them. But today I, I want this morning service to become a little bit more personal, if you will, a little bit more about our local congregation. And so we're going to do two things. And I think uh, having Jim and Sherry Littles back here is just an awesome opportunity for them to talk. They came at a very key and crucial point within the life of this church. Dad had built a number of us. In fact, Brother Ed Davis and myself, I didn't mention this, but Friday night, uh, we were in a preacher's workshop together, and he and I preached really bad. We didn't know what we were doing. And, uh, but God had a call on our lives, each of us, and uh, some assembly was required. In fact, I would say on our boxes, much assembly was required. But... Um, over that time and dad had also others that helped and we built this building and then at the conclusion of that I left for Harvard uh, the Peels left for Wyoming I believe it was um, another elder within the church brother Blake left and retired and dad basically had the bottom of any of that kind of staff drop out from under him and at that time brother James Littles and sister Sherry Littles were able to come and assist my mom and dad for those several years and they were crucial to dad and mom being able to make it during those years mom was fighting cancer and uh, I in fact tried to volunteer to stay home but as good parents they insisted that I leave go to school and so that time period their family was here and so in memory of of what we've done here and what has happened here it is a real honor to have brother and sister littles here to speak personally from their hearts about this place, about this congregation that many of you won't even know about. Um, and then also, in the last 15 years, Dad has really spent, and this congregation has walked with him, I have walked with him, 
in two major endeavors. One is to plant churches, which you heard about yesterday and, and also Friday night. And the second is, is to help the United Pentecostal Church found a graduate school that now has extended itself into an undergraduate institution. And, uh, and he put a lot of years into that. We put a lot of years and a lot of hours and a lot of money into that. And so I, I turn this platform over to Brother and Sister Littles now for them to come and to share their hearts. I'm so honored and happy, as you know, Brother Littles face some medical challenges and that God has been graceful to let them be here. And I'm so grateful to the Lord. Would you welcome Brother and Sister Littles? Thank you. It is definitely an honor and a pleasure to be back here. Um, Brother and Sister Beardsley, I'm going to save you for last. Uh, this congregation was instrumental in, in blessing our family in so many ways. Brother and Sister Klein was a big part of that. They uh, took us hiking and camping and let's see, there were cheesesteaks and Wendy's Frosties and uh, so much fellowship with them. They really blessed us. Um, I was asking our children some of their memories from while we were here, and uh, Stephen, Amanda um, struggled with her height. Um, she's six one, and she hit that height very quickly. So the kids that were her age thought she was older. The kids that were older knew she was younger, so it was hard to make friends. And uh, we would tell her to be proud of her height. Nothing worked. You spoke to her, and you told her to sit up straight, to stand up straight. You did it a couple of times, but that has stuck with her, and she said you've really made a, a difference in her life. You really changed her attitude in life, so thank you so much for that. Um, there were Bible quizzing events while we were here, and uh, many pleasant memories from that. Um, Stan, Seth, uh, he's not here probably this morning. I think they have their own service, but... Um, one of them mentioned that every time there was a baptism, they remember Brother Stan singing, uh, I'm so glad that I've been buried in the name of the Lord. So just sweet, pleasant memories, you know, from their young, tender minds um, and how you've blessed them as Sunday school teachers. Uh, Sister Betty Jones isn't here, and I'm not sure where she goes now, but um, just, oh, she is? Oh, bless you. I want a hug. <laughs> um, it is just so wonderful. Thank you all so much for how you invested into our lives. Uh, Sister Beardsley. Andrea sends her love. You, um, you played that organ through your pain. You never complained. Such a godly example. And then you would go sit down, and she would come over there and put her head in your lap, and you would let her rifle through your Bible. She says, Mom, there were so many bookmarks, and I would just go through, and she says, You know what? I don't know if I put them back in the right place or not. <laughs> but we have very uh, fond memories of how you blessed her with uh, being that substitute grandma for her. Thank you so much. Brother Beardsley. You were the first pastor to ever recognize my ministry as valid and important. Thank you so much. And not just in me, but you invested so much into this congregation. You, you give and you, um, you have just blessed people to serve in, under you and to uh, be what God has called them to be, to just be themselves and to serve God. I was so honored to be a part of this soul-saving station. I mean, I don't think there was a week went by that we weren't baptizing people in Jesus' name. It was an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. Lord truly is gracious in the way that he allows us to be in his body for his purpose and his design. Uh, Sherry and I were in Delaware uh, not to teach the Bible school and not to work at Newark, but we were in Delaware so I could go to a seminary and become a military chaplain. We have dreams and even callings sometimes that get sidetracked and we think they become failures and losses of opportunity to what God has called us to do. But if you continue, as Stephen mentioned this morning, if you continue in the shadow of the cross, God will receive glory regardless of what happens. 
I, uh, in my second summer of military uh, chaplaincy training, I was going to school teaching full time at the Bible College in Dover. I fell and shattered both radial arm heads uh, and broke my ankle the same day. Uh, and because of that, I was not able to continue training as a military chaplain. Uh, so I just continued teaching at Dover while I finished that master's degree. Uh, Pastor James Beardsley, Bishop James Beardsley, was on the board at Dover at the time. And uh, for some reason, they made me academic dean the second year I was there. Uh, and uh, would come in and teach classes for us, such as a pastoral care and counseling class that he taught for us at that time. After we were in Dover five years, we had an opportunity to come to the Newark Church, and we were here for a couple of years, and you've heard some of the pieces that were there. What I found out very quickly is that this church is not one-dimensional. Okay? The vision that Bishop Beardsley has had and continues to have is that the church must work at multiple levels. Uh, to achieve its mission. Uh, I would, we would drive on the parking lot, which was gravel and had mud at the time. We would walk in and see the beautiful carpet, the beautiful pews that you had all put in place, and kind of wondering, how come we're walking through the mud to get to the <laughs> beautiful carpet? But I found out very quickly, this is a teaching point. Uh, when will we get a driveway that's paved? As soon as we have cash to pay for it. Because you see, uh, Bishop Beersley had this weird understanding that stewardship's really important. <laughs> Don't know where he got such an idea, maybe from a good book that we've both read multiple times, but that stewardship was vital and interest was a great thing. It's what bank pays you while you're waiting to use that resource. But the vision of the New York Church and of Brother Beersley is systemic and at multiple levels. Not only starting a church, but a church is not about evangelism. Now that sounds strange and anathema at first, but this church is not about evangelism. It's not about just dunking and getting names on the wall. It's about making disciples who do God's work in the world. And that's two hugely different perspectives. I go to some churches and their goal is evangelism. So they're very good at getting people in, getting them filled with the Spirit, but they're not so good at helping them grow and mature and develop. Yesterday at the banquet we heard so many stories about crises and problems and difficulties who didn't derail people, but instead the cross became ever more effective as they grew in ministry and in development. So this church is about building disciples, not about getting people dunked. Amen. Okay, dunking is vital. It was a part of the discipleship process, and Bishop Beardsley modeled that. He modeled ministry uh, for others, modeled stewardship for others. He became a mentor and a sender, as you have seen, seen already. Uh, it provided structural guidance as those families would go out, that they would have a mother church to continue to come to and to care for and to work with. And that that mentoring and that structural guidance was not... Uh, a cookie cutter approach. So many times it's, this is the way I do it and you're going to be just like me. Uh, I didn't know it until we had been here about 15 months that he was waiting for a crisis to happen in, um, in my relationship with him. He invited me with a crisis in mind. <laughs> okay, I was going to the University of Delaware at the time pursuing uh, a degree for which I had no idea where it would be used or why I was doing it, but the opportunity was there and he supported that dream. I was going to the University of Delaware full-time as a doctoral student. I was working full-time in Dover at the Bible School and was a teaching elder here, as you've heard already. Uh, but he knew when I came there would be a moment when I would teach something that he taught differently. And so he was absent the night that that happened, but he, got a, but he got a phone call from somebody in church as soon as church was over. <laughs> this doctoral student is messing up your teaching on family, so you're going to have to fix him tomorrow. Okay, so we had, we had a meeting, I think it was at Denny's or something like that, and he says, well, I was wondering how long it would take for today to happen. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, you're wrong, do exactly what I say. It was, what did you teach? Where did you get that from? How does that happen? So I'm so thankful that his leadership style is not about, let's see that everybody is exactly structured the same. Now, we all have the same apostolic DNA. 
We're all baptized in the same name. We're all filled with the same spirit. But each of us will fill different places in the body. And that apostolic DNA propels us out to be disciples and to be disciple makers. But aren't you glad this church looks... We don't all look the same. We don't act the same. We don't behave the same. What if we were all Stephen Beardsley? <laughs> Dear God have mercy! <laughs> and we could say the same thing about all of us. The First Corinthians uh, model that the body has to have different members, each of them doing their several parts. And Bishop Beardsley uh, prepared people not just to go out in various forms of ministry, but also to uh, build the local congregation and those daughter works that went uh, forward. When Stephen came back from Harvard, um, I got my sabbatical at Kent Christian College that year because it closed. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Sherry and I were, and our children were homeless for about four months. So fortunately, we had some support, support systems other places. Uh, Pastor Beersley at that time, now Bishop Beersley, was very gracious and said, this doesn't mean you have to leave. There is space. Stephen's coming back, but there is space for your ministry. And as Sherry mentioned, it's so vital for people to be able to speak into your life and say, what you do is important. Yeah. This is valuable in the kingdom. This works. I have also found out that our lives, we have to make some choices along the way. You just can't stand still until you get it exactly settled. If there's anybody in the room that feels a call of God to do a ministry in your local congregation, and you're waiting for the book to be perfectly written for you, each direction for the next 97 steps, it, excuse the English, but it ain't going to happen. We can be locked into fear that if we make the wrong choice, God's going to throw us aside. Bishop Beardsley models different than that. It's better to be moving in his purposes, God's purposes and God's design. For that's what he can direct, direct and guide. You see, the steps of righteous men and women, they are ordered of the Lord. But you've got to be taking steps. Okay, so I do believe that in a, to use a virtual reality language, in an alternate world, Sherry and I could have stayed here the last 20 years. And that you would have provided a space for us here, Bishop Beardsley. And we would not have been sidetracked and devalued and demoted so you could elevate your son above all. You don't function that way. You didn't work that way. You would have valued us. And, and there are, are uh, bittersweet thoughts that come from that of what could have been, should that have been the reality. Uh, but uh, Sherry and I had an opportunity to go to St. Louis so I could uh, do some teaching there because I really didn't know what else to do since my military career was down uh, the tubes, shall we say. So for four years I worked for Gateway College of Evangelism and then God has strange ways of organizing situations. And uh, Dave Norris, who had also gotten a sabbatical the same year from Kent Christian College, and was uh, pastoring in Philadelphia and going to Temple University and teaching uh, at uh, IBC. We were asked by uh, my pastor and the president of Gateway, Tim Dugas, to go and explore at uh, ATS, the Association of Theological Schools in Pittsburgh, uh, to see if the United Pentecostal Church could have a seminary. Uh, so our, both of our lives, Dave's life and my life, had intersected with Bishop Beardsley before. And as that exploratory phase came up, and people were brainstorming ideas about who should be on uh, steering committees and on boards, we were both adamant. Dave and I were both adamant. James Beardsley has to be on this board if it's going to work. Okay, because he has a vision for what has to happen, and he has this strange idea about stewardship, which no one else really gets the same way that he gets. And he's willing to stand up and say it. Just in case you haven't noticed, he's not timid. <laughs> when he has an idea. All right, so it was very quickly in that process, beginning in 1998, uh, three years before we started classes, the process was, uh, seems long, 98 to 2001, but in terms of forming a seminary, that's in about warp speed. <laughs> <laughs> to get things there. And I quickly find out, found out uh, as I worked with that project, worked with others, it was an honor again to have Bishop Beardsley in the process because he was always an advocate for the gospel, 
for faculty and for students. And to do so was an act of stewardship. We have to be stewards of the gospel. This is why we can't just preach a one-dimensional gospel. Because we are called to be stewards of the cross. Uh, the mysteries, as the scripture tells us, the mystery of the godliness, uh, that, that we are stewards of that. But he was stewards of faculty members caring for us and stewards of students. As he served on the Academic Affairs Committee and then became the vice chair, and uh, even was willing to serve on the accreditation, uh, one of the subcommittees. You would think he would say, put me on the steering committee where, where the big decisions are made. But he said, no, I want to be on the committee that sets curricula. Because I want to make sure that the curricula is in the right place. Uh, so we were uh, very honored to have your rocket scientist help us keep those things uh, straight at that, at that time. And uh, as a part of the board, when the accrediting folks came in, he had an opportunity to help them understand the nature of the United Pentecostal Church and the nature of the seminary and, and what was going on. And it was a, a large role in making sure that we were uh, accredited uh, for the first time in the year 2010 and right now we're going through that process again and uh, we miss him dearly going through it this time. I'm sure he does not miss uh, all those committee meetings but Stephen uh, is continuing to help us there as well because uh, uh, the life of the Beardsleys uh, intersect at UGST also. Uh, I think, uh, Pastor Beersley, if I'm not mistaken, the very first semester you taught church history. Uh, flew out to St. Louis every other week to teach uh, church history, the first segment of that, and he has taught almost every semester since then. Uh, it's the longest standing adjunct faculty member, sometimes borders on uh, part-time faculty member. For instance, this year he's teaching three classes for us. And the impact that that has had on students, not just that he goes in and teaches classes, but he provides a great resource. These are all ways in which this church has an impact other places. And it's so honored for me to see uh, Arash and Meg here uh, with you uh, as part of the Beardsley's internship program which they fund and invite uh, prospective uh, church planters to come. Meg was here how many years ago Meg? Uh, four. four years ago was able to come during a summer and to to hear the heartbeat of this church and to see what the model was and now she and Arash are here again because this gospel needs to get to the world. As I mentioned on Friday night, the reason for this season is not Jesus. The reason for this season is every neighborhood that doesn't have a gospel witness. The reason for this season is every hospital that doesn't have a nurse that's baptized in Jesus' name and filled for the, with the Spirit. The reason for the season that every bank has to have people who are working uh, on the uh, check and the uh, teller services as well as the VP offices all along the way. There needs to be apostolic filled people in every slot of every single bank. And until that happens. Until that happens, the Christmas story is not yet complete. So I am so thankful that this church models that, and I am so honored that uh, two students who have survived my teaching over the last number of years are here to get fixed uh, and are able to uh, uh, learn the way more perfectly uh, from all of you. And what a delight it is to see them, and I give them honor this morning as well. A part of this story is that uh, the beauty of being a, a part of the body of Christ is that the, the story doesn't end with you. Some people uh, in Scripture, we know their names. Tabitha, named Dorcas, we know her name. But there were many others, we don't know their name, but they had an impact throughout. And in honor of both uh, of brother and sister Beardsley and... Uh, uh, of Stephen and Regina Beersley. We have, uh, there's been established a scholarship in their name. Uh, so if, Pat, uh, Bishop Beersley, if you would come up, and it's in honor of Sister Beersley as well, but I know the stair negotiation. I just told her I'm going to behave. 
<laughs> uh, Pastor and Sister Stephen Beardsley were extremely um, supportive of this scholarship and beginning the funding of it. This is Apostolic Legends scholarship level at, at Urshan Graduate School of Theology. Psalm 145 verse number 4. One generation shall praise thy works to another. Uh, emphasizing the fact that generations have to hear from each other and have to share the power of the gospel with each other and shall declare thy mighty acts. Uh, Urshan College and Urshan Graduate School of Theology 2013. Uh, Bishop Beersley and Sister Beersley, we are... Every single year at Urshan Graduate School of Theology, there will be a student who receives the Beardsley Scholarship. Every year. I am thankful that the Lord has put leadership in the United Pentecostal Church such as Bishop Beardsley who understands that although teaching Bible studies here is extremely vital, that that also has to spread out in other places and a part of that, not just in founding a version graduate school, but now a scholarship in their honor will continue to reinforce this as we tell the students, I'll have a piece of that. Hey, you better write them a letter. You better let, I'm a letter guy, okay? You better, don't send an email. Right. Don't tweet them. <laughs> they probably don't get tweets, okay? So just send them a letter. I know it's archaic, but send them a letter telling them thank you. And I'll say, this is why you got to tell them thank you. Because they have a vision that precedes this by decades, setting up the graduate school and now making it possible for you to be here. Thank you, Bishop and Sister Beardsley. We are so honored. <laughs> Love you, brother. Love you. And part of that is the younger pastors Beardsley, if Sister Beardsley the other would join us. There's a white glove in here, Stephen. I don't know if you need that to <laughs> polish something. You can put that on if you like, amen. See, the beauty of this is that what happened in one generation is spoken to the next generation. From generation to generation. So a scholarship has also been uh, funded for honoring the younger Beardsleys as well. And we are so grateful for all of this work that has been done. Because this can't stop now. It's the law of sowing and reaping. The more we can sow, the more we will reap. And you don't understand. We don't know today the impact that happens in the future. So as a part of Urshan Graduate School of Theology, I am so uh, honored to be with uh, Pastor and Sister Beardsley this morning as part of the Apostolic Legends. Thank you, Brother Beardsley, for your teaching. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your work on all the committees. Thank you for the care that you have with students. I want to say thank you for inviting our graduates to come back here as well as in the future, other interns. Uh, Stephen and I had a conversation when he was 16. I think he remembers it when I was working in Dover and he was thinking about future plans for his life. So here's one piece of advice I have for you. I don't have a lot to say, but please don't get into school administration. <laughs> Okay, even if they invite you to be a part of the administration in Dover, or I didn't know it then, but that would be short-lived, or UGSD, stay out of administration, stick to the classroom, because that's where the impact is. And as a wise man, he follows my advice far better than I do. So, <laughs> thank you, Stephen, for 
for being that witness in the classroom, that we can be apostolic and we can have academic integrity. You do not have to choose a person of the Spirit or a person of learning. It's actually when we serve Him with our mind and our heart and our spirit, with all that we are, that we are being disciples of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor, for modeling that for this congregation, for students at UGST, and as then as they circle the globe with their ministry. Thank you so much. Mom and Dad, don't go anywhere. I didn't, I didn't release you. <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you, Brother Littles, for your kind words. And um, Regina and I are honored to be able, in, in Mom and Dad's name, to fund uh, this scholarship that will perpetually fund um, a scholarship each year for each student. And uh, we're just honored to be able to participate and uh, to do so in a manner that honors mom and dad. Now, how do you, and, uh, how do you honor people? Most people, you buy them things. That's how we culturally tend to honor people. Buying for James and Eleanor Beardsley is rather problematic. First of all, God has blessed and supplied. And mom and dad have taken what he has supplied and found ways to squeeze it, twist it, pull it, turn it, and multiply it. We all know that. We experience the blessings of that within our own local church and continue to receive that guidance. One of my major challenges in the next 10 to 15 years is when dad finally says to me, I don't want to do the books anymore. Because we have a blessing in his faithfulness and my mother's, not only their trustworthiness, but also their management and their planning. I am able to express vision, but I don't have to figure out how to fund it. Your giving is central to that, but they taught you that. I've continued teaching you that. And so it means if you think that they have done it with, with regard to the church, well, then you know they've done it with regard to their personal. As you know, that we, uh, my mom and my dad have been very committed to one another and that uh, mom's health has not allowed the travel that maybe life would have had had she not had all of the physical. And, um, and so... We can't send them on a cruise. We don't send them on a trip. And, and, uh, and so what we tried to do this, the, in this celebration, in addition to the honor of this scholarship, which makes sense, I know the Woodstown Church a few years ago in trying to honor Dad wanted to give him money, and he made them give it to missions. That's just dad. It's just how he operates. And so I knew that, and I sa said to the committee and those that were working with me, we can try to make them do something, but I I'm, I'm just, I know we're going to fail. And so mom and dad, we've done something a little more personal and something that appeals directly to you. And uh, the congregation already knows about this because they were involved in it. You probably already know about this, but have been discreet to keep your mouth shut. You don't know about it? Oh, wow, we succeeded, church. Amazing. <laughs> it is a well-known fact that you don't get much done around here without one of us knowing about it. And uh, that's a plus but it's also a negative. I have here a large bound leather book, and inside of it, it says, to Reverend James Beardsley and Sister Eleanor Beardsley, with appreciation, Newark United Pentecostal Church, 35th anniversary weekend, 2013. And what is in each of these pages are personal scrapbook pages from families from the church. Thoughts, letters, pictures, drawings, all the kinds of things that many of you see examples of on the tables that you can tell my father and my mother hold on to years later. 
And so we have put together, there's some slots in the back, and if any of you missed getting that in and you want to go ahead and, and submit that, there are places to place those for them. And so mom and dad, we've kind of given you a memory book. And I know that both of you like this. I know you like to look at this because the bottom line, folks, is the stewardship isn't about the money. Never has been and never will be. The stewardship is so that it can stay about the people. And I sure am glad as a pastor that that's the way it is. Mom and Dad, we love you. You hang on, baby. I get to say something. You want to say something? Um. <laughs> First of all, I didn't think this was going to happen. I'm talking about how I feel right now. But, uh, what a ride we've had together. And it's not over yet. It's really been our privilege. You say we've been a blessing, but you're the blessing. You know, you can't have, uh, you really can't have uh, close relationships unless you take a chance. And uh, even though through this period there have been severe heartbreaks, there really have. We made up our mind, we, she and I, made up our mind that we were never going to change given the opportunity that we could get close together and, uh, and that we could care and love. And uh, it, it is so thrilling to come to church. Not just thrilling to have someone that we know through uh, and you've heard the stories about how tough I was on him and these guys here at the banquet and, and that, but it was so things would be safe. But not just that, but I come to church and no matter where I look, like I'm doing now, I see miracles. It's not a matter of judgment. It really is not a matter of saying if you're going to heaven or not. It isn't that. I see miracles. I was always amazed that someone would come to a Bible study and listen to me. I'm not, I'm not being false about that. But we really do care. And we know you care. And in the times where you're struggling and going through growth and teenagers growing up and those kind of things, we know that there's a God who is steady. He's a rock. But he's a tender rock. And uh, we thank you. Um, for all of this, we really do. Um, I said, I said some, I said to somebody, the tension now is not going to be on my wife and I today, or is it? <laughs> and, and we really do. We, we appreciate this. I can't say it enough. And the family's not big enough yet. Even though Steve and Regina have decided that Cassandra is the uh, Omega. <laughs> we have not said there is no Omega in the kingdom of God. Amen. No Omega. Uh, th thank you so much. Because we feel it from you. And I hope you feel it from us too. Because words are so, so in, uh, in, in fact, I'm incapable of really saying it unto you. She's feeling it in her heart. She really does. She shows it to you. I know that. And uh, now you know that this gentle lady here, she grew up with Stephen and I. And she was victorious. <laughs> 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 so do not think she's weak. <laughs> or you're <laughs> She's just gentle. She can say in one sentence something that they zing you that you don't get until about a half hour later. <laughs> God bless you. And we intend to be around here. And thank you for letting us be here. And because um, it would have been unfair 
you know, for someone who, who was just being recognized by you, for us to hang around and be a, we love all of you. And uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing, what he's going to do. And uh, what a precious weekend. And the scrapbook, yeah, to, to give us, I mean, we're not, I, I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to get out of here. The neighbor, Caddy Corner, and they've lived there the whole time, us two, and their kids are grown. They had a, they had a sign on their, uh, it's an older BMW, but they had a sign for sale. And I said to Eleanor, I'm going to buy you that BMW, and then they're going to feel in church that I'm not such a cheapskate about making my wife drive an old car. So I don't know if it was for her or for me, I was going to get her a different car. And um, in her own way, she told me, absolutely not. I love my Honda, and I don't care if it's got rust on the back panels or not. So I tried. <laughs> I tried, didn't I try? <laughs> and one of these days, I'm going to drive in with something that you're going to be really shocked about. And I'll probably have rented it for a week. God bless you. <laughs> Stay standing. If my ushers would come, my musicians would come, we're going to give in the offering and then step out of the way and let God speak through his word. Didn't the Lord speak to us so powerfully Friday night through Dr. Littles? We love the word of God around here. I said to somebody today, I asked them, I said, did you enjoy the banquet? They said, yes. I said, I know it was long. And they said, yes, but it was a good long. And I realized that this weekend, our services are longer than we're used to, but I really believe they've been good long. And uh, so I'm looking forward, Brother Pansley is so uh, gifted and talented, and I know uh, over the months as we've conversed that he has recognized the significance of a word of the Lord in this time, and I believe that he's been prayerful, and I know the Lord has word for us. I know he has it this morning, and I know he has it tonight, and I want to hear it. Anybody here want to hear it? I want to hear what the Lord has to say. Because when the Lord speaks, suns come into existence. When the Lord speaks, moons are hung. When the Lord speaks, mess is put into order. I don't know about you, but I, I want that kind of power going forth into my life. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. Thank you for the blessings of mom and dad. God, thank you for blessing us financially and God giving us instruction in how to handle ourselves with our stewardship. God, bless us now as we participate and we worship you in giving. Let it be used for your kingdom and according to your purposes. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen.
thank you for your mighty works, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you. you. may be seated. So privileged are we to be in this place today and all the elements that it has represented have uh, such a, a wonderful confirmation in the spirit. It is the right thing for the right reasons. And I uh, again say to Pastor Beardsley and to Bishop Beardsley, thank you so much for allowing us to just uh, be witness to it and uh, to feel the spirit of it. We're at a point in our life where we're on the back nine of our ministry. We've been in Cincinnati 35 years, but have only been in pastoral service about 20 of those. And uh, as we look toward the future and uh, have a sense of, of the uh, next generation and what have you, these type of experiences and uh, examples are so very, very important. So I thank you on behalf of Cincinnati and uh, its future if the Lord tarries, but uh, I certainly say yea and amen to everything that has gone forward, and uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be with this wonderful group. Um, I texted my executive pastor and said, you got to pray for me. I'm preaching in front of a bunch of PhDs and former professors and what have you, and that's always intimidating in its own way. But it's, it's so good to be with uh, Brother and Sister Littles, this precious man the Lord used to speak into my life in my very first class at the Urshan Graduate School and really just gave us direction and definition uh, for the Calvary Church and its wonderful people and our mission. And then, uh, as I mentioned, I had Brother Stephen Beardsley uh, twice for church history and then Luke Acts, and I've been assured that with continued therapy, I'll make a full recovery. <laughs> Amen. So I'm staying faithful to my medication, my prayer and fasting, and <laughs> the post Beardsley syndrome will fade. Amen. It's, uh, uh, yeah, well, I have the mic, son. You need to just <laughs> relax. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, well, you said he keeps the books, so I feel good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it has been an extraordinary experience, a young man that you meet in Bible quizzing, who then, with such skill and anointing and education, uh, helps you grow in your ministry. I tell you, you want to be nice to young people and to children. They grow up to be powerful. <laughs> And significant trust me on this amen thank God and this whole weekend is all about one thing this place is about one thing that's the souls of men and women in eternity so if I could sing for you this morning a very old song almost an anthem if you will that really sums that up that despite it all if our testimony is the status of our soul is well then life has been worth living amen you worship with me as i lift up the lord this morning It is 
is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the blue of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole it is nailed to the cross and I bear Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well. The day when the faith shall be signed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord he shall. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That's the bottom line. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord today. Our bishop has given me multiple assurances to just be at peace with the time and I do understand the uniqueness of this day and the things that have been included in it. But I'm mindful of the time as you can tell. I don't miss a Sunday meal. Praise God. <laughs> and I do not intend to miss one today. <laughs> but I do also intend to give you the word of the Lord that he has put in my heart for this wonderful time, this landmark time in this historic weekend. Amen. And so from the revelation of Jesus Christ, I read beginning in chapter 1 at verse 1. And you're hearing today the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon, everyone say soon, soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. Everyone say near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, 
Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And made us a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. With the help of the Lord this morning, can I preach to you on this thought? We live in certain times. We live in certain times. The Lord bless you. you may be seated. I really enjoy uh, satellite radio in my car. I'm able to listen to my beloved Reds wherever I am in the country. I'm able to listen to Fox News un until I get real depressed and have to turn it to Laugh USA to feel better about things. As I was pulling out of the church one evening rather late, uh, the talking head there at Fox News had given the facts as grim as they were. And then he got a little winsome, a little personal, and with a trail in his voice said, we live in such uncertain times. It's unusual that a, a man who just gives the facts and not really the spin, if you will, would, would give in to such an overwhelming sense because I think that's the summary of the society we live in. And from man's perspective, they are uncertain times. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Our once proud economy, the envy of the world, is now propped up by countries that have and will continue to be our enemies. The daily headlines read like the words of the Lord as he described the end times with wars and rumors of wars, and pestilence and earthquakes all over the world and signs in the heaven above and in the earth beneath this historic storm that hit the Philippines. The worst storm to ever come on land over 200 miles an hour. Folks, it's not just anomalies of, wow, you know, I don't remember it ever being that way. These are announcements of the coming of the Lord. These are indications and signs that, that God is giving to a world that needs to see something beyond its immediate realities. The world is adrift in chaos and confusion and people are desperate. People are fearful. They know something is happening, but they don't know what. They know they need to do something, and they don't know what. And thank God for this church and the churches that have come from it that lift a voice with an answer, that offer a message of hope. And I want to say to the church of the living God, despite these realities, and I do not deny them or deprecate them, despite the, re the, the reality of the society we find ourselves in that's just so grim and getting so much worse. Let it not be so among us, because I submit to you that never before in the history of this planet have the events taking place been more orchestrated or outlined or organized by the sovereign hand of God than they are right now. And as we are just a few days away from a, a new year, and I have to tell you, I, I don't know if it's age or <clears throat> I'm just getting cynical. I'm not as excited about the new year. I used to have this, this sense that the new year will leave behind some of the problems that was in the previous year, and we kind of get a fresh start. But, but this tsunami of, of ominous uh, things that are just lined up that you see coming to a head. I, I almost dread 2014 in that sense. And yet at the same time, I believe that God has his hand on all things and that all the events of every day, everywhere affecting everyone, are in the hands of God, that we are not adrift that we are not hopeless, that there is nothing left to chance in this day, I tell you. The Lord Jesus Christ 
is large and in charge. And he still, as the old gospel hymn says, he has the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. We live in certain times. Amen, amen, amen. And the strength of government and men is, is now replaced by, by weakness and anarchy and confusion. But we're, we're living and serving the one that of the increase of his government and kingdom, there shall be no end. Amen? And in the midst of this unprecedented time, there is a renewed look to prophecy. The search for answers as to what has happened and more importantly, they want to know what's going to happen has taken a spike. It's become an obsession with some, if you will, with a sense of desperation. If, if I would run some ads in the paper and put a sign out on the expressway that we're going to talk about the end time and who is the Antichrist and what is the world economic future going to be, I couldn't park the cars. They'd be lined out to the street, if you will, to get in the door. Uh, I, I've been doing a little thinking. It's been 38 years that I have been a full-time student of the Scripture. I'm no theologian, but I am a student. And I thank God for every day and every forum and every venue. Seven years I've been institutionalized by the United Pentecostal Church International. <laughs> Amen. And uh, my parole has been a good one. I thank God for that. But all this prophecy stuff, it's all over the map, isn't it? You can hear different ideas and theories, and, and the enemy just tries to distract us and divide us and to dull us from great truth that we need in this day. But in my quest, if you will, to, to be a student of the Scripture, I, I want to just give this big picture of the New Testament, if you will. There is one book of prophecy. It is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. There are 21 books to believers Churches called by name, addressed specifically. Those epistles, those letters to the saved are written with the express purpose of helping them navigate the process of transformation. The wonder that begins at the new birth, if you will. God's work on us after conversion. Aren't you glad that that was just being born again? That you didn't come up and dry off and say, is that it? Oh no, welcome. Welcome to the process. Welcome to a life change, if you will. But those epistles are guides on how to mature and grow in Christ after that new birth. That's 21 to 1, if you will. And I don't know where you are on this subject, but if you're so obsessed with those elements of prophecy, I want to challenge you to get into the Word on how to be saved. And how to grow in the things of God and what have you. I, I was so blessed and, and uh, just so impacted by probably the greatest teacher of prophecy in the post-Azusa Street era. And that was Reverend S.G. Norris. And this precious man had, had taught prophecy for over 60 years. He forgot more about prophecy than most folks would ever know. But he had a very simple and unwavering rule. He refused to fill in the blanks. If the Bible wasn't clear, he didn't just feel compelled or authorized to tell you, and that's what this means. And that's what that symbolism is. And that's what that metaphor represents, if you will. And people are determined, it seems, to fill in the blanks of prophecy. And there are some. There are. Who's the Antichrist? They've been asking that question since I sat down in St. Paul, Minnesota in the fall of 1975. And it seemed like in the late 70s, the general consensus was it's Henry Kissinger. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb today and say, I don't think it's Henry. <laughs> Even though we had this cold stone lock way to calculate it, and here it was. If you gave a numerical designation equivalent to the letters of the alphabet, A meaning one, B meaning two, and so forth. Yeah. And you added up Henry Kissinger, his name totaled, wait for it, 666. <laughs> oh God, can there be anything more certain? <laughs> yes, I'll just say yes. <laughs> What's the mark of the beast? What does 666 mean to people in everyday terms? How long is the tribulation? When does it start in relation to the rapture? I mean, it's just, there's a lot of things, if you will. 
And there are clear answers. There's some directives on some of those deals. But here's what I know about the Word of God. It is absolute truth. I say it's absolute truth. There's nothing left to private interpretation. God's Word is final. It's not for man to twist and adjust and manipulate to an earthly agenda. The Word of God is living. It is timeless. It is relevant to all generations. And the Scripture is absolutely clear and without question when it outlines what it takes to be saved. That the message of salvation is sure. That we repent. That we are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. And we speak in tongues as the initial evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. There is no debate to that, I say. Everybody say amen. amen. The areas of the book of Revelation that are not detailed but are left to John's visions. And John's descriptions of heavenly events with earthly words, I submit to you, those are intentional. And any who try and decode those details and offer an explanation, they're reduced to opinions at best. And if God wanted us to know, he would have clearly told us. He has demonstrated that throughout this book. There is a clear message of revelation. It is vital to the 21st century. It has been heretofore overlooked in the mindless pursuit of the prophetic details and left out uh, by those who, who really have another agenda. But the truth to be gleaned with certainty from the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ for today are many, and I submit them to you as part of our time together. Most try and make sense of the visions of revelation by looking to the future, by decoding the images in terms of the contemporary politics and forecasting how our history will unfold. And in so doing, there is a vital and tragic flaw to the laws of the exegesis of all Scripture. That when you are drawing out from the Scripture, what does the book say to us? We must first understand that it is written to make sense and to speak to its initial audience, to those to whom it was originally written. And as we read in the opening, this was written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Newsflash, it did not come from the pen of John, put in a bottle, and then he put a note on the outside, do not open till the 21st century. That's not how this book was intended. In fact, there is a strong case to be made that it was the most widely read book in the first century by that church. And what did it say to them then, in real time? Such a vital document. The book of Revelation, with its amazing and fantastic images, invites the believers of the first century to perceive the truth within the realities that they were facing daily. And it was a tough time. The 21st century is challenging on a lot of fronts, fronts politically and socially and economically. But imagine in the first century, with the Roman Empire collapsing, with the globe sinking into such uncertainty, if you will. And the book of Revelation initially invited, invited and enabled first century Christians to number one, find freedom from the myth that the emperor was a divine creature. You know, he would try to espouse and position himself as being not just a man so that whatever he said and did was okay and had the final say. You know, we've got some folks on this planet today who think that they are really in charge, that they're really going to decide our fate, that they're really given the authority to make differences and, and to make policy and what have you. But I say to you that the heart of the king is still in the hands of the Lord, and God is still bigger than any elected official or any man or woman who would espouse to have power on this earth. They are all still subject to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. Yeah. Amen, amen. amen. Secondly, the book of Revelation wanted to help them escape the tainted prosperity of the Mediterranean culture. Wow, does that ring true? It was a day so consumed with finance because the world economy was collapsing. Does that ring true today? It's unbelievable that 20 centuries later, you and I are fighting the same pressure. You and I are fighting the same 
message because we believe that by giving we have more when we live with less because we put some into the hands of God. And John was telling them, look, don't think that this world's economy is your economy. I'm so glad to understand that the promises of God are greater than Wall Street and greater than the District of Columbia, that I trust a God who's going to take care of his people like he always has. Clap your hands to the glory of the Lord. Amen. And thirdly, John wrote to help them be loosed from the violence dubbed as the rule of law. Let me tell you, you live in a very violent world. And I'm not just talking about the horrors of school shootings or the unspeakable atrocities of, of public massacres in malls and what have you, but in a culture that has on its books that you can doom unborn children to death. We are awash in the sea of the blood of the unborn. It's a violent world, and you and I have got to love men and women and be driven by a care for people that are not a part of us but need to be. Amen. And I hear the Word of God ring true in the 21st century in these same points. It was written to free them to live their lives within the truth of the gospel, to adhere to divine truth that is of, of eternal value. My friends, the purpose so the revelation of Jesus Christ was not only to discern the fulfillment of the predictions of contemporary history or mapping the last seven years of the tribulation. The message was to discern the true nature of the society around them in the terms of Jesus Christ. To see the world with an understanding that the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world is triumphant in the light of the fact that the wrath of God awaits unrighteousness, and the rewards of God await righteousness. That's the lens you and I have got to face the world with in the day in which we find ourselves. Some that pursue exhaustive knowledge of the Antichrist need to stop and say, who is Jesus Christ? Amen, amen. amen. Our view gets skewed by the Jack Van Empies. And the Hal Lindsey types who try and decode its vision with regard to events happening now. And from that to extrapolate what will occur in our day. Technology just makes them recalibrate everything. I remember sitting in Bible school and hearing them say, and how would the world all see an image at once? Because no one could imagine that on every phone in the world that would be possible. So just about the time man thinks he has all the answers, God changes all the questions. Way to go, God. So far we've been able to overlook their annual revisions. The fact that, well, this changes that and political shifts and what have you. After endless revisions and adjustments and just fails and misses, people are cynical. What's happened is it's dulled them to the reality that eternity is real. And that Jesus Christ is coming. And you'd better live like it. Because eternity has consequence. And that's what Revelation declares. And I, I just want us to step back. And I know this congregation can certainly handle it. And what is the genre of the text? Just how is this book written? And how should we receive it and understand it? Number one, it is a letter. It is addressed to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Secondly, Revelation is early Christian prophecy. It does not mean prediction. It means a declaration of what God is doing, of God's perspective on life and people. If there are points about the future, it's imminent, near, close, as we read together. And finally, Revelation is apocalypse. The book of Revelation as apocalypse. From apocalypsis meaning unveiling, lifting the veil, the revelation. And what is Unveiled. What is the apocalypse of this book? The current events of the audience are placed in the context of a sacred history of God's activity. Carefully defined plan. Listen, everything that's happening is exactly the way God wants it to be happening. Amen. Hear me now. Life on earth is put in the sphere of the invisible world. And our human situation is put in the realm of the supernatural 
And an apocalypse is a communication that puts everyday situations in perspective by looking at the bigger context, and that is eternity. My friends, eternity is the context of life. Eternity is what everything must be factored through, if you will. It has the power to comfort the marginalized. Amen. If, if you think you can't make it, well, just tie another knot in the rope and use both hands because you don't have long. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. It encourages the discouraged. So when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. And it's to urge us all to live values that are consistent with our faith. I'm telling you, if you believe that Jesus is coming, it's time to live like it. It's time to pray like it. It's time to give like it. It's time to be faithful like we understand it's going to be over soon. Amen, amen, amen. The purpose of the apocalypse is not to figure out the future. It's rather to get the reader to examine their behavior in light of the pending end of time and the beginning of eternity. Eternity marked by eternal life and eternal death. The purpose of the book of Revelation for people here and now is to see that no matter what this world says, and its messages are relentless, the bombarding of our minds with ideas and messages. Look around. People can't sit down without the glow of their phone within seconds. It's unbelievable. And there's an agenda to that, I'm telling you. And, and I pray that the Lord help us. That, that even though those images are relentless and there is an idea, there is a, an agenda in the world today to reshape and reframe the minds and thoughts of men and women, I, I submit to you God is the final source of all events. And God's truth endures to all generations. And no matter how real the culture appears, no matter how compelling its lies are, the greater truth is defined not by man, it is not defined by events, but the greater truth is defined by the Word of God. It is the final say on everything. It alone determines the ultimate truth for life on this planet, that there is an eternity coming, one which will reward the good according to God's laws, and one that will judge evil according to God's laws, and society and earthly power does not influence that process. Rather, it is subject to that process. Those first century Christians were being convinced that Rome was ruling the world. And you and I can, can get overwhelmed with the fact that people that don't know us and don't care are making policies that we're having to live with that are redefining our lives, if you will. And it's not true. God rules. God reigns. Amen. And the amazing vision of the new Jerusalem. Oh, friends, be encouraged. It's splendor. It's reward for the bride of Christ. There is a heaven to gain. Amen. An amazing place of peace and treasure. And I, I can't get my head around it. I, I just can't. But I, I, I thank John for trying, using earthly, temporal words to describe heavenly, eternal visions. Let me tell you. If I'd have seen some of that stuff, I'd have just written on a piece of paper, you would not believe what I just saw. <laughs> Stay tuned for exciting developments. Put that in a bottle and send it off. But he tries, he, he talks about walls of jasper and gates of pearl and streets of gold. I don't know, anybody heard a commercial about gold this year? Anybody? Anybody here conscious? <laughs> Stay with me. Okay? You know, it's those commercials that you've got to protect your investments with gold. It's the only thing that will endure. Hard currency, gold, gold. You know, gold, the thing you can barely get enough to go around your finger. They used to put it in your chiclets, but now people will knock you out and pull your teeth. They don't do it anymore. Really, they don't. Gold. Well, here's what I know about that place. Here's what I know about heaven. 
the most valuable sought after thing in the world. Where you and I are living now, over there it's the asphalt of the day. Now I can get my head around that. That what is worth the most here is worth the least there. So why would I live my life in pursuit of what has no value in terms of my eternity? Come on, somebody. It'd be like me thinking a pothole is a gold mine. Look, hon, we're set for life. I picked up a piece of the street. I've tried that, and the brunette is not impressed, and she ain't buying it. But that's heaven, that's eternity, what people are dying for in this life. We're going to walk on over there. Oh, my friend, you make sure that you understand what is important according to this book, not according to the next Wall Street reports, not according to the next spin or advertisements, if you will. I want to follow truth, truth that endures, truth that saves to the uttermost. Amen. Clap your hands to the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. I tell you, it's a world that's going to be judged with multiple manifestations of the wrath of God in proportions that have never been seen and cannot be comprehended. It will be without mercy. It will be without relent, without historical equal. Men will cry out to die for relief, and they cannot find it. The world will follow evil only to see it destroyed by God's power. More important than the identity of the Antichrist is the fact that the risen Christ will crush and vanquish all evil. And he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Sin will be paid for with an eternal price according to the word of God. So I encourage you, read the book of Revelation. Read it. It makes clear that this present time must be lived in a way that considers eternity. And I submit to you, whatever we must endure in this life, as Paul said, is nothing to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That Paul was not kidding when he said, I have not seen and ear hath not heard. It hath not entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. That we would read it and understand that no pleasure of sin that is for a season should replace the joy of eternity that is without end. The book of Revelation, it's not just about mystery solved or the future predicted. It's about the opportunity to be ready for the certainty of eternity that rewards this life in an eternal context. The message to the church in the first century is the same to the church of the 21st century. Life ends, eternity begins, and consequences based on how we live our life is what awaits us all. Revelation unveils the fact that our conduct here and now, our choices in this vapor that we call life, is so very, very important. We live in certain times. Revelation is valuable. It establishes the fact that there's coming a time when the mercy of God on this planet and mankind will be replaced by his wrath without limit or measure. Wrath poured out like vials. Wrath emptied from bowls. Wrath sounded like trumpets. Don't you think for a moment that this year of our Lord is an uncertain time. Never has there been a time more certain on earth. Never has there been a day that says if you're going to do something, now's the time to do it. Because the time is short. I appreciate this, this new project that the church is beginning, this new discovery for the next congregation to be started. I appreciate the due diligence and the, the process that it represents, but I'm telling you, my friends, if you're here today and you're trying to take all this in, you know, it's hard to get your, your mind around 35 years. It's, it's hard to realize how long this, this faithful family has served and 
that this church has been in existence to make such a difference in the Lamb's book of life. To change what eternity looks like by being here. What does your eternity look like? Are you ready? Do the events around us say anything to you except, man, it's colder than I remember. It's hotter than it used to be. Seems like people are just in such unrest. Instability in the marketplace. The financial uncertainty. What's that say to you? I hope it screams to us. The end is near and be ready. I, I don't know what you believe, but I could tell you how you can find out what you believe. It's not by your rhetoric. People can belch more religious baloney than anything on the face of the earth. Lord have mercy. You, you can listen to them talk and you'd think they walk on water. How do you even shower? Good grief, you know. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. Your beliefs are proven by your conduct. So step back and look at what have you stated as your beliefs this past year. You believe this is the real thing? You believe there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun? You believe that there is an expiration date to life as we know it? If we do, our conduct will confirm it. Amen. I'm not trying to scare anybody. If I want you to be scared, just go watch the news. That'll scare you. I'm just trying to get you to think a little bit. Try to get us to wake up to some things. Try to help us to ask this question, am I living like I know it's going to end? And I'm ready for that? And so at this time where we celebrate what has been and this significant point in the journey, I appreciate the the narrative of Brother Beardsley, uh, the pastor, to say, but it's, it's not just about the past. It's about our future. It's about what are we going to do till Jesus comes. We're going to keep doing the good work of the gospel. We're going to keep spreading the gospel around the world. We're going to keep reaching into hell and pulling people out. We're going to bring hope to the hopeless and help to the dying. We're going to help people in this area who think there's no way out. Find a way out. Because if Jesus could save us, he could save anybody. Amen? If Jesus could do it for you, he's got others he wants to do it for. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. This world, it's so overwhelming. It's so demanding. It's so compelling. It's so convincing. But am I living like it's going to end? Am I living according to the culture or am I living according to the Word? You know, I, I submit to you the culture doesn't dictate to the Word, contrary to some churches. But you're in a place where the Word dictates to the culture. Amen. That what I believe and what I practice and how I live my life, how I do my finances, how I pursue my relationships, all of those things are defined by the Word of God. And this day with its agenda to control us and define our values and beliefs and bully us and scare us. Oh, friends. Live like eternity is real. Live like heaven is real. Live like you know that God's in charge. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me today? Lord, how desperate we are to be your people and the sheep of your pasture. I thank you, Lord, for every family, every individual, and the sound of my voice today. I pray, God, as we are headed to the end of another year, another year that you have given us to prepare to be a part of eternity. Pray, Lord, that you'll just help us to do a little inventory. Does my conduct say, I really believe you're coming, Lord? Do my decisions say, I am, I am sure of eternity and the certainty of an eternal destiny. 
Oh God, I pray that you'll help us. Bring us back to what really matters. Replace the fear of the day with the hope of our tomorrows based on a God who's able, a God who's in charge. And Lord, don't let us just feel aimless and hopeless and wandering through life, but we live in certain times. We, need, we live in the times of your design and your purpose as you're bringing it all to a close, Lord. So thank you for a church that deals with eternity. Thank you for a church that's not just a, a social venture, not just a, a holiday phenomenon, but a, a place that exists because eternity is real. Thank you for leadership that speaks into our lives to challenge us to not just live for the here and now, but to embrace eternity. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to raise my children with an example and in an environment that prepares them for eternity. Thank you, Lord, for a place to invest beyond the marketplace and into eternity. Oh, God, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord. So I pray, God, that fear will be replaced with peace. Pray, Lord, that our confidence will be in you and that you will hold it all in your hands, Lord. You're able. We belong to you, Jesus. Praise God. If you could join me at the front, I wish you could come as families. I wish mom and dad, you'd, you'd get the kids and we would step forward to say, Brother Pasley, we're, we're going to face a new year with confidence in our faithful God. These are certain times. The things that are happening are unprecedented, without equal. Never seen it before, but there's certain times because God is the God of this world. He is able. He is in charge. He's orchestrating it all together. Lord, help us. Help us as families, Jesus, to make choices for eternity. The promotions we take, the hours we work, the availability, Lord, the financial decisions we make, Lord, let them be reflective of eternity, God. In Jesus' name I pray. The certainty of the times, Lord, that tell us it's not just a world adrift, but it is a world on a collision course with forever. In Jesus' name, oh God, give us values that match eternity, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, Mom and Dad, would you begin to lift your voice? Young adult, would you begin to lift your voice? Would you say, God, I'm trusting you with my future, Lord. I'm trusting you with my tomorrows, Lord. I thank you for this church that will minister to our family, minister to our babies, minister to our young people, minister to our relationships, to our seniors, Lord. I thank you, God for a place that has eternity in mind. I thank you, God, for a ministry that lifts up the power of forever in our hearing, Lord, and how to be ready for it in Jesus' name. These certain times, Lord, you are still the God that rules and reigns, Lord. We are not just the victims of government, Lord. We are not just in the hands of decision makers, but our lives are in your hands, Lord. Cover us, bless us, protect us, God. Let us feel your peace. Remind us, Lord, of the angel of the Lord that encamps round about us every day. Hallelujah! In a day when men's hearts fail for fear, let us, Lord, lift up our heads, Jesus. You're coming soon. Eternity is upon us, God. The certainty of the time is without debate in Jesus' name. Refresh and encourage, Lord. Bless those who live for eternity. Bless those who make decisions based on eternity. Encourage those, Lord, who, who don't sink into the message of the temporary and trade it for the reality of forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Lift your hands today. Be confident. Be at peace today. Be assured today. God's going to take care of us. God's going to protect us. Hallelujah. These are certain times. People that don't know need to know the God that we're living for. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let us heed the word of the Lord that comes across this desk. Let us give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say. 
in these vital times in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah 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 praise the name of Jesus praise the name of Jesus praise the name of Jesus hallelujah 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 today's present action is tomorrow's past this whole weekend has been designed to bring us to, to tonight you don't want to miss tonight because as much as we honor the past and we celebrate the present we must continue to live dictated by the future the end point is eternity but between the present and the end of time our present actions that will become a part of the history of the past have such impact on eternity how many of you are glad that you know how to go to heaven who out there will only know because of what we are doing today he's left this gospel in our hands he did not leave it in anyone else's hands in fact he performed the miracle of transferring or revealing his word which is eternal which is timeless which is him into human form the scriptures so that we humans could share it with other humans and have lives transformed it's in our hands we're not alone he's with us he will not leave us he will not forsake us the spirit will empower us he'll give us the words to speak but it is in our hands your life is in your hands are you living today understanding that the larger context is eternity But even more important or perhaps in, in, in a corporate sense more important is are we as a congregation living today understanding that the context of our actions is eternity I'm not making a commentary here but I want you to understand something and each of you have to have to live this out but brother Pasley came to the platform before as we were giving in the offer and he says dude you gotta buy your dad a car <laughs> and I I looked at him and I said if I bought it he'd sell it <laughs> he said well don't give him the title To which I said, it just won't work. <laughs> now what, what's the deal? Am I making a commentary on a car? Absolutely not. I love my little yellow roller skate. I enjoy it. <laughs> it's smartest to pay cash for those things, I will tell you. You don't pay interest. But the point, what is, what is behind that? My mom and my dad that we've honored, this church, our ethos is that for 35 years without trying to figure out when the end is coming I know y'all froze up when he started reading out of Revelation I saw you y'all going oh my goodness is he gonna go be a goof <laughs> he's been he's been through Dr. Little's classes he's been through Dr. Brickle's classes he's been through Dr. Beardsley's classes he was not gonna be a goof but we have lived 
And we must recommit to living, knowing that it's not about now, except that what we do now has an impact on the future. And that ultimate future is eternity. So what neighbor is counting on you to, in your suffering, live as a Christian? What lost soul across the world is counting on your five dollars every single week that goes into missions? You say, what? That's pathetic. It's not enough. It's not. No, there's a soul across the world that's counting on because that five dollars across that year is going to enable that missionary to take that trip to that village that then the gospel goes forward. Our sacrifices and our stretching ourselves to send people out instead of hold them in. Who's going to be reached because of it? So Newark, we are honoring the past. We are certainly celebrating the present. But we must commit to the future. And I hope you're encouraged to examine your life, examine your peace in the corporate body of Christ on how we're doing. Not to condemnation, but to reflection, and if necessary, correction. And if not correction, an encouragement that let's just keep on going. Because God is going to save the world. And he's going to do it through us. Thank you, Brother Pasley, for speaking to us. He is not going to miss lunch. <laughs> and neither are you. Can we lift our hands to the Lord one more time in worship? Jesus, we praise you today. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness, O oh God. Help us, Lord, not to be overwhelmed by the burden, but at the same time, O oh God, Yes, Jesus, give us the encouragement to understand that you are working through us. God, it is going to be by the body of Christ that you are going to reach the world, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, O oh God. Yes, Jesus, we love you and we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, I, the Lord, did make humanity. I made you with a will of your own and a choice to be made. But I also made you so that you could be with me for eternity. And in the midst of confusion, in the midst of heartbreak, in the midst of killings and wars, I am the Lord. I'm going to say to you again, I am the Lord. And you can be in my kingdom before you're with me in heaven. And I am the Lord. And I do all things well. So do not be discouraged. Yes, these are certain times. For my will will be done. Yes, Lord. And I am in this place to touch your life now. Make the right choice. I gave you the opportunity to make the right choice. And are you going to have to either focus on me or focus on you? And if you focus on me, my focus is on you. And I will bless you, say it for Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Praise God. Let me encourage you, take time. The building will be open. You can browse, look at pictures, all of those kinds of things. We'll be back here at 5 o'clock. The building will be open for prayer. Again, things will be up. You can view and browse and so forth. We're going to have a great time tonight in our final service of the weekend. God bless you. Enjoy your lunch and your rest. Come back prepared for the Lord to minister to us.